worship you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you, God. Oh, hallelujah. We worship you. We worship you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeshua. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. Oh God, Lord, in my head, everybody was so afraid. We worship you. We worship you. Oh God, how we love you and honor you. Oh, thank you for your goodness. Oh, we worship you. Thank you, Lord. You know, I keep hearing in my heart, I was going to go a different direction, but I just, I just feel like the Holy Spirit pulled me back into something that he wants to say and do very briefly. And those of you that are watching, how many of you remember the story with uh, Zacchaeus? And, uh, you know, we often sing about it. He was a wee little man. Remember, he climbed up in the sycamore tree. Do you remember what Zacchaeus' request was? That the Lord would come to his house. And I feel like some of you are getting ready to join with some relatives or you're getting ready to join at your house or somebody else's house. Maybe you're going places where you're not looking forward to it. You ever had a few of those Thanksgivings? But I think what we need to do this Thanksgiving, especially what God has done and is doing in our nation, what he's about to do even around the world for some of you that you watch what has taken place in our country that we want God to come to our house. We want God to visit our families. Come on, our loved ones. There's been a lot of strife among families and tension, you know, over the political realm, opinions, culture. And I just feel like this Thanksgiving, man, we just need to put a lot of that aside. And there needs to be something that God does, that he comes and visits our home. Some of you have struggled in your home financially to pay for your rent, your bills. Maybe some of you, you know, you're struggling in your home to feel like, wow, you know, to make ends meet, or maybe you're struggling in your home, you're not feeling right, so you're not enjoying life. I felt like the Holy Spirit just adjusted me and say, no, pray for the people that this year I'm gonna come to their house. That there's a visitation of God himself. So this is what I pray. I pray first and foremost, Lord, that this Thanksgiving holiday, it is a peaceful holiday, as well as even through and up into Christmas and even beyond. I pray preservation. We are preserved coming in and going out. We're preserved in between. We're preserved that not one of our feet shall fall. Our soul is preserved. We're preserved from evil. Our health is preserved. And Lord, we speak a divine protection of your angelic hosts that encamp around us, that no harm and no evil cannot befall us. No plague cannot come near our house, cannot come near our dwelling. There's not one sick among us, not one feeble among us, for we are the healed of the Lord, and we are blessed. Now, God, I pray, come to our house, Yeshua. We sing Yeshua, but now we invite you to come. Come, come through this season. For some of us that might be alone and we have no one to spend time with, Lord, let them feel your presence, that there will be no loneliness, no depression, no sorrow. God, no anxiety and fear. And I pray that, Yeshua, you would come to our home. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But we believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and we shall be saved and even our families as well. We pray a peace over this Thanksgiving, a peace even over this holiday season into Christmas and the new year. We, pay, we pray that there would be a, a healing among broken relationships, fractured relationships, tension among friends and family. Yeshua, come to our home, come to our house, come. And may your visitation Repair the waste places and establish a reset. Something new that happens. We welcome you. Now I want you to do this. I want you to say out of your own mouth, however you want to do it, you repeat after me or whatever, just say, Yeshua, come to my house. 
come to the place that I gather. Come to my Thanksgiving meal. Come to my life. I want your visitation. I want your presence. I receive your peace. I receive your grace. I receive your mercy. I receive your help. I receive your blessing. Bless me and my family with your visitation. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You know, I, I think there's something, you know, the, the Lord said something to me the other day. I'll get into it in my message so I won't belabor here. But, you know, he, he spoke a word about 2025. He spoke one word to me, just like one, like a word, one word. And then he began to elaborate on it. And I'll tell you about that as I preach on it in the weeks ahead. But we are in for an amazing time with God. And this is not the time to get discouraged. So I just want to encourage you to keep your eyes on God and keep your gratitude big in your heart. Will you do that? All right, I want you to do this. I want you to greet somebody and I want you to say, I bet I know, I bet I know what you're having on New Year's Day. <laughs> you thought Thanksgiving, see, I got you. All right, go ahead and greet one another. See, see if you can figure it out. All right, bless you. All right, let's go on. I want you to um, open your Bibles to Psalm 106. I won't keep you very long. How many of you are planning on traveling? Uh, you have places to go, people to see. Oh, that's good. I'm glad that uh, some of you, you know, need to get some rest. How many have people coming to your house for Thanksgiving? All right, you know how that is. So, okay, I want to teach you something. You know, people have... Uh, often asked me before, and this ought to be every single one of our quests in life. How many honestly want to know God? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, you know, that shouldn't even be a question, but, you know, I don't want it to sound religious either, but I mean, I mean I'm asking this, do you really want to know God? How many of you really want to know God? Do you really want to know God? Those of you that are here, you know, I really want to know God. And I say that because, yeah, I know God, but I want to go deeper. And, and I'm going to share with you a scripture here in a moment. And I don't want you to think of it in the context of, hey, this is just a Thanksgiving scripture or a Thanksgiving principle. I want you to take it as something that can help you to go deeper in your walk with God. Things that will attract God to you like a magnet. All right, let's look at Psalm 106, verse 1. We'll come back to this passage uh, throughout my short message here. It says, praise the Lord. Now, pay attention. There's three, three things here, three principles of how to get closer to God and three principles of how to be blessed and stay blessed. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Underline that one. That's the first one. Give thanks unto the Lord. We'll talk about that in a moment. For he is good. That's the second one. Is if you really want to have an intimate relationship with God, settle the, settle the, the issue of his character. You know, don't question his character. You know, you think about all the things that Job went through. Remember, how many of you ever read the book of Job? In fact, you know, when I first um, got saved, you know, I thought it was the book of Job. And so I thought, boy, that's a lousy place to go if you need a job, right? You guys are so, I mean, I'm making great jokes from the start of the service. <laughs> oh, stop. Okay. You're shaking your head like, I don't believe that. All right, but anyway, don't go to the book of Job for um, a job. But anyway, the point of Job, that's really it, is, you know, and all the things that he went through, you know, come on, you know how it is, all the things that he went through. And, and the Bible says not one time in all of his shame did he ever find in God a reason to blame. No, his friends came and, and tried to get him to blame and bring an indictment, but he never questioned. He never, he never did that with God. He didn't touch God with his mouth. So establish that God is good. You have to know that. We'll talk about that. And then the last one is of this verse, for his mercy endures forever. So learn to give thanks, number one. Number two, establish God's character. He's a good God, and we'll show you that. He even said it about himself. And the third thing is his mercy. Come on, unmerited, undeserved favor. Look at what God did for our nation. Look at, look at the things that we are celebrating as a people. It is amazing what happened. 
you know, just with the, our White House, with the Senate, the House, things that are getting ready to, to come. Our economy, watch how that begins to change for the better. I mean, we are heading into some really great seasons and stuff, but it has to do with mercy. And something that I've often said to God, and I know he doesn't like it, so we have to be very careful when we do this, is I always tell God, God, I don't deserve it. Now, you know, I would encourage you, don't go around going, I don't deserve it, I'm not worthy. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about understanding that none of us are worthy. We've been made righteous by the blood of Jesus, but what I'm talking about is there is times where God lavishes me so much with his blessings that it's like I say to God, I'm not deserving of this. I'm not telling you, please don't do it. I'm just saying, I just want you to know, God, you are really, really blessing me, and I, and I, don't, I don't feel like I deserve any of this, and I, and I respect you greatly, and I want to honor that. So let's go look at the first principle, and it's thanksgiving. You know, the Bible talks about, look at Psalm 92, verse 1. It says, it's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto his name, most high. Well, why is it a good thing to give thanks? Have you ever thought about that? And you think about the culture we live in. You think about the United States of America. Think about some of the things that have created a lot of drama in our country as people who want to steal the freedom from somebody else. Look at the things that have been in our culture. People who are ungrateful. The people who feel a sense of entitlement. Or how about this? People that want to move out of America over a political figure. You know, because there's an ungrateful spirit that gets on people. And one thing that I've learned, you know, they were singing in the tabernacle back in 2 Chronicles 5 in Solomon's temple. And they kept saying, Lord, they were saying, Psalm 106, Lord, we give thanks to you. You are good and your mercy endures forever. And it drew God like a magnet. Have you ever got around crusty people? You ever got around mean-spirited people? Bryn and I dealt with a mean-spirited person person a few uh, days back. And I just sat there and I go, man, they have not changed. They are just so mean spirited. And then I started looking at it. Why are they mean? Why are they so crusty? Because they feel like everybody owes them something and they're not grateful for anything. And so they, they sit there and they wallow in their pig's mire of this happened to them, that happened to them. And so they mistreat people. And if they would just be grateful and it, it would soften their heart. So part of the reason why it's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord, it keeps you from being crusty. It keeps you from being hard-hearted. It keeps you from being, you know, a kind of person nobody wants to be around. And when you have a thankful heart, you have the heart of God. God is a very giving, he, he, he is so appreciative. And so you have to establish that. And I just want to say this. I did this in the first service. So a few nights ago, I mentioned to you that, um, you know, I don't know about you, but a lot of times when I wake up in the middle of the night, you know, I, uh, I, I like to wait to see if, if God's going to come into my room, if I'm going to have some kind of uh, supernatural experience because I've had a few, you know, and, and I wait to see, God, are you going to talk to me because I'm here? You know, my eyes are wide awake, you know, the dogs are snoring. And, uh, you know, I'm like, have you ever had your dog snore? It's pretty funny. Pretty funny. Yeah, it is. And, and I'm like, God, are you going to talk to me? And then God talks to you. And we were having a great conversation. And I really told him after it, I said, Lord, this is very, very amazing to me. Just for a moment, you know, I was just laying there in bed. I didn't want to disturb Brenda. Didn't want to disturb the dogs. And I was just, you know, fellowshipping with God. And, and I was thanking him for everything that he was, you know, doing in our ministry and my life and different things that are unfolding. And I was just thanking him and thanking him. And then I got to a really important part. And I want you to hear this before the sight and the witness of God himself. I got to you and I started praying for you. And I started praying for you that are watching. And, um, you know, I, I said to God, and I really want to say this to you, we just witnessed something. Uh, that I'm very grateful for. You know, we had a, a road in the middle of building a tabernacle. God said to, you know, repair the road. I came to you. We thought it was going to be like $600,000. It wound up being 850000 closer to nine hundred. You never complained. You never wrote me nasty letters, but you, you pulled out your, your checkbook. And we paid it off. And, and that's not the only thing that you did. You know, when God said, buy the pizza machine, um, without really a lot of notice and we needed money right away, I came to you. Not once did you question it. You opened up your heart and your treasure, and we own that today. 
The uh, headquarters building, you know, what are you going to do with 100 employees? Well, you got to have a place to meet. Came to you with short notice. The, uh, they were looking to sell it to somebody else. I'm speaking to you that are watching. Once again, your heart and your treasure showed up, and I was giving thanks for that. Then I talked to the Lord about this tabernacle. I said, God, how in the world are we going to build this? Look at what God has done, but look at what you helped him do. And I, I just wanted to give you uh, honor today. And I was telling that to the Lord as I was praying for you. I was uh, asking him to bless you. I was asking him to remember how kind you've been to him and how kind you've been uh, to this ministry. And I just wanted to personally thank you for all that you've done, even the kind letters that you give, the kind cards, pastor's appreciation. You, you, you know, we prayed over every one of those, Brenda and I, and your words were so kind. Your uh, thoughtfulness to write what you wrote, your gifts meant more to me than I think words can express. And I just wanted you to know that I am very grateful and I'm very thankful for you. So I thank you for, for your love. So <clears throat> let's talk about this. Now, I mentioned this in the first service, if, if it might be, you know, 10 here, 10 there in the total number. So I went out and I thought, okay, how many times in the Old Testament is the word thanksgiving or thanks mentioned. Listen to this. In the Old Testament, the word thanksgiving is mentioned 102 times. Wow. The word thanks is mentioned 72 times. In the New Testament, the word thankfulness is mentioned 73 times. And thanksgiving, that word, is mentioned 71. Then you go over to the book of Psalms, and the word giving thanks is mentioned 30 times. Even the word gratitude over 150 times throughout the Bible. Isn't that amazing? And yet it's the thing that sometimes we forget to do with God. I remember years ago, Brenda and I, we were uh, writing out a, a, what we call a petitioner's request. It's where you go before the court of heaven and you bring a petition, a specific request before God. And at that time, we were really struggling with a lot of things. And we uh, wrote a list out. We even wrote out how much that we were believing God that he would bring into our budget every month. We were believing God for a certain amount of meetings to preach because that's how we made our living is we would travel on the road. How many of you ever, uh, you know, had a job or maybe you have a job that's based on commission? You ever had that? Man, I used to, one time, remember mom when I sold women's shoes? Dad says, and this is what I always wondered. I worked for my dad and my mom, right? Uh, when I was a little little boy, and my dad came to me and says, "Hank, you need to get a you need to really get a job where you understand work." And I'm like, "Well, I'm working here, but evidently, I was not. I was probably not the best employee, right, Mom? Yeah, I was the night manager once. Dad made me the night manager, and guess who I managed? Me. <laughs> I was the only one. And the first night that I was the night manager, um, how many of you from Omaha here, you know where Anthony's Steakhouse used to be? My dad's Amico station was right next to it. And the first night of being the night manager, I was locking the place up and I opened the bathroom door and I yelled in, anybody in? Nobody answered until Anthony Fushinero called my dad at like two in the morning and said, hey, uh, Rocky, you have somebody locked in your bathroom. And it was some old dude. He had shimmied himself up the side of the stall, pushed the window open. He was yelling, help! I locked him in. He didn't hear me, but it wasn't my fault. As the night manager, I tried. You know? <laughs> what does that have to do with anything? Huh? Oh, I sold women's shoes. That's what I did, and I lived off of commission, and I got, uh, I got let go because I sold more shoes than the manager. Isn't that crazy? That was crazy, man. I, I cared for people's soul. That's why, you know. So, but, but, all right, stop, stop, stop. I have no idea what rabbit trail I'm going down here. I'm trying to figure this out. Let me pull it back here. So what's my point? Huh? Oh, thank you, honey. You are actually listening. So anyway, <laughs> I think wives are supposed to listen, right? All right, so anyway, here's the thing. So we made this list up, and, uh, you know, we were believing for how many jobs and all this, and we shoved it in a box and kind of forgot about it. And then when we moved to Omaha to start this church, we were going through boxes, and all of a sudden I pulled out this list. And every one of those things and more that we put on that list, God answered. And I felt really, really stupid because... I wasn't thankful. You know, we have to be careful with God. And I want to show you something. So let's talk about Jesus. How many times in scripture did Jesus use the word thanks? And this is what I found. 
There were really seven times, and I'm not talking about different examples that he used to give thanks or to be, you know, have gratitude, but that seven times. One time, it was when he lifted his eyes up and he gave thanks in John 11, and he raised a dead man who'd been dead four days, Lazarus. Another time, he's talking about how give thanks for the, for, uh, you know, different things, um, names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And, and then I found out of the seven times that five places were consistent. You know what it was? And this is where I got convicted. Are you ready? Was having to do with the meal. And if you read about when Jesus fed the 5,000, he fed the 4,000, he would give thanks before he would take of the actual uh, communion part of the uh, Lord's Supper, the actual Passover meal, meal, he gave thanks. Even at the time of receiving his body and blood, he gave thanks. And I thought to myself, think about how many times we've had a plate set before us, and we pray that prayer, God is good, God is great, I'm so hungry, I'm gonna eat this plate. Or God is good, God is great, I'm so hungry, I can't wait. And we hurry through our, our prayer. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, Hank, settle the plate and tell the people their health will be great. See, sometimes we don't realize if you will settle and honor the plate, your life and your health will be great. Because the Bible says in the book of Exodus that one of the rites of covenant was that he would bless your bread and he would bless your water. Those of you that are watching, he said in Psalm 103, part of your benefits, that he would satisfy your mouth with good things so that your youth would be renewed like the eagle. So sometimes we're so busy shoving something that can bring an honor to us. Come on, when Jesus said, think not about tomorrow, and he covered the men, he covered the women, he said, don't be concerned what you're going to eat. Come on, that's the men. Every day I ask Brenda, what's for supper? Right? Every day, Brenda, for 35 years. I ask her because, you know, she can cook. But here's the point. What shall you wear? That's the women. When you settle the honor of the plate. When you understand, God, I give you thanks, and we don't just hurry through it. Now, don't pray those long prayers where the food gets cold, because how many of you know as the chef and the cook? Brenda always calls me for dinner, and I have like a short time to get there. Eastbound and down, load it up and get there. Right? You remember that famous song? Eastbound and down. She's talking about a plate of food, man. You better get up there while that food is hot. How many of you are like that? And that's one of your pet peeves. And so, you know, you get up, yeah, you don't like cold food. So don't pray the, you know, forever prayer. I remember Richard Roberts, I don't know if you're watching. He told me about Catherine Kuhlman. You all remember Catherine Kuhlman? You know how he said she used to pray over her food? Now, remember Catherine Kuhlman? She was a lady that had the, the flowing, um, like, gown, and she would talk very dramatic. You know, hello, you know, like that. And she would, she would get an, a plate in front of her and she'd say, they'd say, Catherine, would you pray? She'd say, of course. And all she would say is, Lord, we're grateful. That's all she would say. But it was so sincere that everybody would fall under the power and you could have all you could eat because nobody, I'm preaching great here and you're in Thanksgiving zone, you know? <laughs> Tell me to do that at Thanksgiving. Lord, we're grateful. And when Matt and John fall into the power, I'm going to grab all the dessert I can. But, you know, don't make it, uh, but make it sincere is the key. But settle the plate. He'll bless your bread. He'll bless your water. Think about it. Now, what also is connected to Thanksgiving? Why is that important? Because the supernatural, Pastor Christie was telling me this, and Brenda, uh, Pastor Brenda at the, uh, between services, every time Jesus gave thanks and he broke the bread, Something supernatural happened. Come on, how many want something supernatural? And what do we do? We skip over the plate. And very rarely do we show honor to God. I mean, I'm speaking to me, man, because I'm looking at that food, and I started a really bad habit about a month ago. A year ago, Brenda decided to bring, and I pronounce it Shih Tzu. I know how you normally, but I'm a pastor. I can't say that from the pulpit, how it's pronounced, right? So, but he's my little friend. His name is Herbie, and he's a year old now, and at first I didn't like him because I wanted a fourth German shepherd. And I was starting, Chris, if you're watching, our incredible breeder, I was breaking Brenda down. I almost had her convinced for a fourth shepherd until last November, December, she shows up with that little dog. And I looked at him, I'm like, 
I don't think we're going to be friends. I'm a big dog guy. No, he's my buddy. I hold him. You know, he growls. He does this. And then I rub his stomach and he goes. He likes it, you know. And, but I started a really bad habit. I based it off of the scripture where the Syrophoenician woman came and said, even the dogs gather the crumbs from the table. So now, you know, I take the food and I look, make sure Brenda's not looking and I sneak it to the dogs and, and I've created a bad habit. Now they, anyway, I'll, I'll work on it, Brenda. What's my point? Not sure. Now here's the thing. The point is settle the plate, show honor to the plate. And watch what God begins to do to unlock something supernatural in your life. All right, look at this, though. This one is a hard one. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And, you know, it says, rejoice so evermore. It says, pray without ceasing. You know, that's why you have to do what Jesus did. Where the Bible says in John 11, he lifted up his eyes. That's how you pray without ceasing, is you go throughout the day and you remember God. Those of you that are watching, you think about God. You say a prayer to God. And, and it keeps you connected to the supernatural realm. It keeps you connected to God, especially the thanksgiving part. Now notice this part, verse 18. Nobody likes this one. In all things give thanks. And that's not saying, thank you, Lord, that I'm sick. No, no. It's not accepting a condition. Now, listen to me. It's not accepting a condition that violates the blood covenant. Okay. I'm not accepting poverty. That violates the blood. I'm not accepting depression because that violates the covenant. Jesus had the crown of thorns. I'm not accepting sickness and, or am I thankful for it? Because uh, Psalm 129 says the plowers plow Jesus's back, making deep long the furrow so that by those plow marks, those stripes, you're healed. What it means by giving thanks is, is if something happens in your life, you don't settle for it. You give thanks that you have the answer. You give thanks that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You give thanks that there's going to be a deliverance, that there's going to be a healing manifested. You give thanks that provision is going to come. And I remember one year, have you ever been on vacation? How many of you have been on vacation? How many wish you're on vacation? I feel like you all are in vacation. I'm preaching great and I'm getting two amens. All right, let's go. I'm going to try this section. How am I doing? Good. Thank you for the most uh, supportive group right here. Thank you. Thank you. Now, how am I doing? No, I had to ask you. You guys were the most quiet section. No, no, you weren't. No. But here, here's the point, though. The point is when you go on vacation, you're getting ready to do something, and you've got everything planned out, your budget, what you're going to do, you've been saving money, you're getting ready to leave. And one year or a few years ago, we were getting ready to leave for vacation, and all of a sudden I said, Brenda, it's hot in this house. She's like, I know. I went and looked at the thermometer or thermostat, thermostat, and thermometers and all that. It was really hot. It was like 90 some degrees. The air conditioner went out right when we we're going. I'm like, we can't go on vacation. So we called, got the guy over. He gives me the estimate. I'm like, that is all of our vacation money, man. And I was so mad. You talk about being hot in the house. I was hot under the collar. And I come in the house and Brenda's like, Hank, you know, the Bible says, and I said, Brenda, I know what that book says. I read it. I study it. I meditate on it. I know where the maps are, the concordance. You ever had it where you don't want to have anybody be spiritual at that moment? Right? Oh, man, I'm really preaching good, and you all are hiding behind your... Come on. No, but the last person you want is Scripture, Sister Scripture. Well, I had Sister Scripture. She was married to me. And she looks at me and she says, Hank, the Bible. I said, Brent, I don't, I don't want it. And so I mumbled and grumbled and stumbled. And I, she holds her hand out. She goes, get over here. We're going to pray about this. I'm like, Brenda, the air conditioner is out. I didn't want to be pastoral. I didn't want to practice what I preach. I didn't want to hear my own sermons going off in my own head. But scripture sister over here grabbed my hands. So the Bible says, in all things give thanks. I said, well, you do it first. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm going to warm up to it, right? <laughs> you ever had that? I don't want to give thanks, God. I'm mad. I'm a tither. And I'm a nice guy on top of it. You ever done that one before? I have. I'm good. I'm good, God. Okay? I'm trying. To... And then I get in the Italian zone. I'm trying to be good, God. I mean, I don't know what the problem is with you. Huh? 
Come on, it's my godfather. Why did he want you? What's up here? I'm trying to talk to you. You're not paying attention. <laughs> and then you realize what you do. So then I'm Irish, so I switch to Irish. Top of the morning to you, Father. <laughs> Right? And you kind of try to make it up with God. All right. So anyway, I went to the scripture sister, the wife. And we started giving thanks. And do you know what happened? Again, when you give thanks, it's connected to the heart of God. And it draws God to you. And as I said, it releases something supernatural. All of a sudden, we watch God do something supernatural regarding our air conditioner. And we're enjoying it today. Okay, we are. Now look at Psalm 106. Look at verse 1 again. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he's what? He's good. And his mercy endures forever. Now, we often just, you know, camp out on that verse. But you've got to go down to the following verses. Like, look at verse 9. And this is human nature. See, being a person who thanks God on a regular basis will keep you from getting crusty, will keep you from getting an attitude, will keep you in the right spirit. It'll keep you blessed, right? So watch what God did. He rebuked the Red Sea, dried it up, and led him through the depths of the wilderness. He saved him out of the hands of those that hated them and the hands of the enemy. Sounds like our election. And the waters covered the enemy. Sounded like our voting. And there was not one of them left. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And then they believed his words, and they sang his praise. Come on, that's Exodus 14. You go over to Exodus 15, and they're singing. They're grabbing the tambourine. Uh, Moses grabs a microphone because it says it's the song of Moses. I mean, he was singing. Ah! Right? At least in my cartoon mind, that's what I think. But anyway, he, they were celebrating. And do you know what happened? Three days later. They go because they're thirsty, and God brings them on purpose to some water, and it's called Mara, and it literally means bitterness. And they were looking in the water. It was a mirror. And what that, what that water was is a reflection of their bitter heart. They became ungrateful, unthankful. Look at what God says. I led them. You sang praises, and then you soon forgot my works. And they waited not for my counsel. Look at verse 21. They forgot God their Savior, which had done great things. Come on. They murmured in their tents. They murmured in their car. They murmured at the restaurant after church service. And they didn't listen to the Lord. See, when you get out of Thanksgiving and you get out of being thankful, you'll get over into complaining. Thankful, you see, and, and I said this to God the other day. I said, God, you know, if there's anything that I think made you mad and, and grieved in scriptures when the people forgot. Come on, how many of you have ever given a gift to your kids? And it's like, Mom, I know you're looking at me. All right, so we're talking about all the other kids. All right, so, right. But you know how you buy all those toys and they only play with them for like one hour? And then they want the next year's uh, catalog, right? Because they're ungrateful. We're, we're ungrateful, right? And so, you know, they quickly forget. Thankfulness always, when people would forget, would grieve God. It would make him mad. And when they would get over into complaining, in fact, you know, we're, we often say God keeps the score. You could read that in the book of Numbers. God even came down to Israel and said, you are complaining and murmuring these 10 times. Yeah, true. Yeah. Yikes, say yikes. Look at your neighbor and say yikes. Now look at 2 Thess uh, Timothy. This is important because look at what it says about this generation. It says in the last days, there's going to be some dangerous times that will come. And then it kind of describes the culture and the dangerous people. Men are going to love themselves. Come on, have we not seen that with the selfie generation? You know, I don't even know how to take a selfie. They were trying because they said, you know, Pastor Hank, you know, your audience would like to see more of you uh, doing like raw, what do you call it, like raw video. And I said, okay, I can do that. So they were trying to show me how to do it. I said, I'm done. I don't know how to do that. Every time the thing would turn around, I was like, where's my head? You know? And then they say, well, snap the picture. And I'm like, and then I'd snap it. I'm like, Oh, that's what my wall looks like? And I couldn't find myself. How many are good at taking selfies? No, no. How many are not good at taking selfies? No. Okay, look at all these hands in here. And it's, it's mostly the non-millennials. That's crazy. 
But lovers of their own self, covetous boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents. But look at this one, unthankful. Man, we live in a very ungrateful, unthankful generation. People are just not happy with, with things. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's one thing if it's evil, right, and corrupt. I'm not talking about that. But we live in the greatest nation on the face of the earth. There's no way we should even consider what was being offered on the menu from the left. All right, now look at Romans 1.21. This is, this is another one. So look at this. Because, you know, they, they transformed, you know, worshiping the creature rather than the creator God. It says, they knew not God, they glorified him not as God, and neither were they thankful, but they became vain in their imagination. Okay, so notice they weren't even thankful. So notice what it did. It, it affected their psyche. So what I'm saying. People who aren't thankful or who are ungrateful, it, it affects their psyche. It affects how they look at things. It affects how they answer people, how they treat people, how they think. Come on. Right? I'm preaching real good. Now look at Luke chapter 17. Maybe I'll just get off at this point and go to the next one. And I'll get some more amens. And it came to pass as Jesus went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And he entered into a certain village and he met 10 men that were lepers. Now you have to understand leprosy would eat uh, body parts. You know, it would eat, it was like a skin eating, uh, organ eating. It would eat the sides of a person's face off. It'd eat their ear off, their nose, their hands. And you could tell that somebody had leprosy or the effects of it because something would be eaten. And they met these 10 lepers and they stood afar off because they were not allowed to come in. And they lifted up their voices and notice what they said, our opening text, Jesus, have mercy on us. Come on, sometimes that's the greatest prayer you need to pray. Yeshua himself carried his own blood, not the blood of a bull or of goats or of calves, but he carried his own blood from his own body, an innocent man, and he put it upon the greatest, highest seat of authority, the mercy seat. That's why it says in the book of Psalms that his mercy is even higher above the heavens. You know why? There's no other higher place than the mercy seat of God himself, his throne, that the mercy of God, you don't deserve anything outside of his blood. That's how powerful that is. So have mercy on us. Look at what happened. Verse 14, when they saw him, they said unto him, go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass as they went to do that, they were cleansed, they were healed. Now watch this. And only one, look at the ratio between thankful and unthankful. Those that honor the plate and those that don't. Those that over this election say, thank you God. And those that don't even say anything. Roe versus Wade happened and you couldn't find any, uh, very many pastors or churches that stood up in their pulpits and thanked God. They're afraid to speak about it. It's crazy. But there was one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back. And with a loud voice, he glorified God. Look at what happens. He fell down his face, giving thanks, for he was a Samaritan. Come on, man. He wasn't even supposed to be next to a Jew. That was a racial conflict, man. Now he's fallen down. He put his face to the ground, which is, by the way, the highest form of worship. That's why when Satan appeared to Jesus in Luke 4 and Matthew 4 at, his, at the temptation in the wilderness, what did the devil tempt him? Say, listen, if you really are the son of God, bow down like to kiss the ground. That's what it meant. And worship me. So there's something to be said. Look at verse 17. And Jesus said, were there not 10 that were cleansed, but where are the other nine? Now stop right there. Where are the other nine? What was Jesus really saying? He wasn't just saying, where's the nine other nine lepers? He was saying, where are, let's read between the lines, those of you that are watching. He was saying, where are the other nine unthankful, ungrateful people? Don't think God doesn't pay attention. When we're rushing through life, taking credit for a lot of things that we have, a lot of things that we do, and we don't stop and really consider the source. God, I thank you. I mean, every time I come on this property, I have to lift up my eyes to God, and I have to say, look at what you did, God, and the beautiful people. He noticed who was thankful and who wasn't. Now notice what's in it, verse 18. Something supernatural happens. Remember, Jesus would give thanks when he, when he said, uh, when he broke the, the bread, the five loaves and two fishes, what did it do? It multiplied, something supernatural. When he, when he said, this is my body and this is my blood, 
What, what happened? He said, he that eats my flesh and drinks my blood has my life in them. Again, something supernatural happens when you receive communion, but when you connect it to thanksgiving. He said, look at verse 19. He said to the one, the one thankful, arise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. I said it to you last week, those of you that are watching, notice the higher level of blessing that comes from being a, a thankful, grateful person. The other nine unthankful people, yeah, they got healed. But everybody in town knew what was eating at them. We have to be careful. There's too many things that we're allowing culture, politics, religion, things as we get older eat at us. We need to be more and more grateful and thankful to God. Because notice the one, nobody in town Nobody that ever knew that this guy had leprosy. There was no natural physical evidence. Nothing was eaten off. No scarring. Nothing. Imagine what can happen to your heart. Rather than complaining about how you've been mistreated your whole life, start giving thanks for God for those who do appreciate you. Start giving thanks for the spouse that is on its way coming to you that you haven't even seen manifested rather than complaining about, yeah, I did it, that guy, and he was a jerk. Well, keep letting leprosy eat at you. And then when you finally do meet one, they're going to see how you're missing your nose. You're not a whole person. You're not even ready for a relationship. Oh, this is good preaching. Okay, let's go to the next one since you didn't like the first part. Part Two, the Lord is good. Let's talk about this. Look at Psalm 145 out of the Niv. I like this part. Speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. Tell of your power, your awesome works, and I'll proclaim your great deeds. I will celebrate your abundant goodness. Notice it says, I will celebrate your abundant goodness. So how many know that God is abundantly good? Look at this last part. The Lord is gracious, verse uh, eight. Slow to anger, rich in love, verse nine. The Lord is good to all. Lift up your hands and say, Lord, thank you for being good to me. Yes, now go over to John 10. We're gonna bring this to a very quick close as Pastor Doug's gonna come in about three minutes and 42 seconds. In John 10, notice this. Jesus makes a distinction. He says the devil is the one that steals, kills, and destroys. This is why now notice what Jesus said. The devil steals, kills, and destroys, but notice, notice, but I've come that you might have life. What kind of life? That in the Greek is the Zoe life. It's the God kind of life. What kind of life is that? It's your benefits of Psalm 103. Come on. He forgives you of all your iniquities. He heals you of every disease. He redeems your life from destruction. He crowns your life with tender mercy and loving kindness. He, he satisfies your mouth with good things. Come on, there's that plate. So that your youth is renewed like the eagle. You don't have to walk like you're Mr. Magoo. You can't see, you can't hear, and you're... <laughs> yeah, anyway. You don't have to walk like that. You don't have to act like that. Right? Your youth is renewed. He executes righteousness and justice for any of you that have been oppressed, so quit complaining. Right? These are your benefits. So that's why I never go around well when somebody, you know, they, you know, I've had people, you know, they, there's a, you know, they're, you know, 21 and they die. Oh, must have been their time. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. The reason Jesus became the sin offering. He became the curse. Do you know why Jesus died at 33? It's because it's called premature death. So that what he paid for and what happened to him in his physical body at 33, you don't have to die prematurely. He paid for it. You can live long. Well, I don't believe that. He came to give you life. John 10, 10. You know what that life is? Come on, it's Psalm 91, 16, with long life. He has satisfied you. You know what Marilyn Hickey told me? Satisfy, what it literally means is as many sunsets and sunrises that you choose according to the long lifespan of man up to 120 some years of age. You get to decide too. Well, I don't believe that. Well then, what about Genesis 15, 15? The Abrahamic covenant. 
that when God made a covenant with Abraham, says, you're going to go to your fathers in peace. That means nothing missing, nothing broken. Not in sickness, not in disease, not as a result of a tragedy or calamity, not as a result of a wicked and unruly person. No, it's going to be in peace. And when I finally go, it's going to be in a good old age. You might be saying, but that's Abraham. Yes, but it's your covenant. Galatians 3, 13 and 14 said, Cursed is every man who hangs on the tree. Well, did Jesus hang on a tree? He hung on the cross. And it says that Jesus became that curse. He became the sin offering. That's why he died at 33. So that the blessings of Abraham, what was the blessing of Abraham? Abraham, you're going to go to your grave peacefully. Yeshua didn't, but you are. Yeshua went to his grave at 33. uh, Abraham, you went at 120 some years of age. That's your right too. It says in Galatians 3, the blessings of Abraham is yours through Jesus. You have a right to land. You have a right to increase the favors. You have a right to go to your fathers in peace in your grave in a good old age. Come on. That's the kind of life. That's why God is a good God. Look at, he explains it in verse 11. He follows up. He said, man, I've come to give you abundant life. You know what that abundant life is? Psalm 23, 6. Come on, we, we only use Psalm 23 at funerals, and we religiousize it, and we don't realize when he says, I'm the Lord, I'm your shepherd, and you'll not want. In other words, I'll provide your needs, man. Then he says in verse 6 of Psalm 23, every single day is to be filled with that abundant life that your good shepherd said. That's part of him being a good God to you. And he was so good, he provided it in your covenant by innocent blood. Every day, goodness and mercy follows you. You need to declare that rather than, oh, life stinks. You know, people that, you know, write on social media, I can't take it anymore. Why not? You're not supposed to take it anyway. Squalling and bawling doesn't get God's attention. What gets his attention is you remind him what he already provided for, and you hold him to it. Now, I've had a few brat sessions with God, and I've done that. I'm like, Lord, tomorrow at such and such time, you and the brat are meeting, and I'm getting this off my chest. I'm going to let you know how I feel. I did that about two months ago. I was mad at evangelicals because they weren't voting. And they went in there. I said, God, your people, these evangelicals, they make me so mad your people. And he said to me, Hank, and it's almost like he was laughing. I'm like, Lord, this isn't funny. He said, they're your people. No, they're not. (laughs) Have you ever noticed that with Moses and God, they went back and forth? Your people, God. No, your people, Moses. Moses, no, God, they're your people. And finally, I think they settled on it. It was both their people, and I think that's what we did. But, But at least... They voted. Many of them showed up. Still 35 million that didn't. So anyway, well, we'll work on that. All right. So God is good. Say God is good. All right. Let's close up this shop. Now, look at this. This is what I like. Look at Exodus 33, 18. So Moses and God are getting ready to meet. And he says, God, I plead with you. Verse 18. Show me your glory. Look at verse 19. The first thing that God says is I'm going to cause all my goodness to pass before you. And I'm going to proclaim my name. All right, stop right there. God's going to proclaim his name, all right? When when finally I I gave in to Brenda's desire because she was chasing me so hard, wanting me to go out with her because we were prayer partners, I showed up at her house for a date, and I didn't go, hi, I'm a jerk. No, I showed up. I looked nice. I I probably, Brenda, didn't even spray. I I probably didn't wear one of those T-shirts I sprayed with right guard like six times when you're a bachelor. And you just re-wear it, and then you... I actually probably showed up with a brand new t-shirt for you. You know what she asked me one day? All right, this is private and confidential. We're family, right? No, we're not family? Okay. So when we got married, she said, Hank, she said, can I ask you a question? I said, what's that? She goes, you know, you're a bachelor for like four, I think it's like four years, or almost five. Almost five. She said, like... Did you ever wash your bedding? What are you talking about, Brenda? Did you wash your bedding? 
I'm a dude. I'm like, you wash bedding? I said, I don't think I did. She goes, well, then what did you sleep in? I said, a sleeping bag for five years. And I never washed it. Because I didn't think you washed a sleeping bag. Okay, now you really are judging me. I can feel the judgment. I can, I can feel the judge. I can feel the judgment coming through the camera. I can, I, especially the section up in the bleachers. I mean, you're, I can really feel the judgment coming from. Oh my God, the guy probably stunk to hogs heaven. Probably did. But when I took Brenda out that day, I put my best foot forward. Had a clean T-shirt on, Brenda. I know I did. Thank God. Okay, but this is. I say all that because this is my point. Okay, look at Exodus 34. So God now is introducing himself to Moses. Look at the first thing he says. He passes by him in verse 6. He says, I am the good God. Here's my name. I'm the Lord. I am merciful. I am gracious. I am long-suffering. I'm abundant in goodness and truth. Man, can you? that's how he introduced himself. Now, 2 Chronicles 30.18 talks about Hezekiah when he prayed. If you notice in 2 Chronicles 30, 18, he says he calls the Lord the, the, the good Lord. How many of you have the names of God book? I think Marilyn has that, Marilyn Hickey in Hebrew, like, you know, Jehovah Jireh, you know, Jehovah is God, Jireh is the Lord, our provider. How about Jehovah Nisi? What is that one, y'all remember? Lord is our banner, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord is our healer. Well, I was talking to Marilyn Hickey. Notice where it says, but Hezekiah prayed for them, saying, the good Lord. That is, um, I can't pronounce it, but it, it literally means Jehovah the good. So part of when God said, I'll cause my name to pass by you, and he connected his name to his goodness, he's Jehovah the good. It's written in his very core being of who he is. All right, let's talk lastly about his mercy. <clears throat> mercy is God extending his compassion, unmerited favor. Deuteronomy 4.31, the Lord God is a merciful God. Now, I want to show you this as we close. Look at when... Mary gets a visitation from an angel. In verse 46 of Luke 1, this is very powerful, because how many of you know we just came into a Hebrew New Year of hey? <laughs> Remember God was saying September 22nd, hey, Jewish New Year, hey. He's trying to get our attention, and it also means grace. Mercy, because remember, the number five is connected to hey in the Hebrew. And it means grace, it means mercy. God was trying to wave at us, even when we are all afraid a few weeks ago. Hey, I'm entering you into a month, or not a month, a season of grace and mercy. All right, let me end this here. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirits rejoice in the God, my Savior. Look at verse 50. And notice what she drew attention to. And his mercy is on them that fear him. Something that you need to pray, and those of you that are watching, ask for God's mercy to rest on you. Verse 54, he has helped his servant and remembered his mercy. Don't ever be afraid to ask God to help you and to give you his mercy. That's, that's how come you're supposed to come boldly to the throne, Hebrews 4, 16. When you come, you don't even have to ask. Just expect grace, mercy, and help. Notice now <clears throat> in verse 72 and 77 through 78, Zechariah begins to say, he has come to perform mercy. Don't be afraid to ask God. Perform your mercy concerning me, God. P perform your mercy concerning this. And then remember your holy covenant. How does God remember his covenant? When you remind him. Okay. Verse 77 through 78, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God. Sometimes I've said to God, Lord, I just need you to be tender with me right now. I need your tender mercy. And don't be afraid to ask him of that. Lastly, I just want to encourage you this Thanksgiving. To take your thanksgiving and your thanks to a whole nother level of gratitude. Remember, let's, let's settle the plate. Let's honor the plate. You know, if you're at a place that you can't pray a prayer, do it before you get there. So Lord, before I eat this meal, I'm gonna give you thanks and I'm gonna give you honor. And I thank you that you've taken sickness and disease away and health and wholeness is my portion. How many of you be willing to step it up in your thanksgiving? How many of you be willing to say, you know, God, I'm going to keep reminding you, and I'm going to remind myself of your goodness? Number three, God, I'm going to be a person that's going to continually, respectfully ask you to perform your mercy concerning me. Unmerited, undeserved favor. You know, yeah, with that 
that drive, Pastor Doug, come out there. There was times where, a couple times I woke up in the middle of the night and I said, Lord, you know, you told me to do it. I, I'm not questioning that, <clears throat> but I'm asking you to perform your mercy. We need to get these things paid off so we can move on with other things. And watch what God does. Remember, when you give thanks, what's connected to it? The supernatural. Amen? All right, give it up for Pastor Doug. Happy Thanksgiving. I love you. Thank you for letting me be here. And thank you, precious little babies. Oh, and children. That was really special, so thank you so much. All right, yeah. eat up. And if you want some of those recipes, they are at the beginning of this service. You can get some ideas. Ah.